Welcome back to our introduction to PMO abstract models. Uh, this is part three, and we're in this video we're looking at abstract constraints. So if you've been following the video so far, we've already looked at sets, parameters, and data files. We've made decision variables. We've looked at objective functions, and now we're doing um, sets of constraints. So we're going to add the constraints to our model. This is our entire model. I know it will be fuzzy on your screen. Um, but we're going to do this chunk of the model right here, um, which is creating constraints. And if we look at our CSL concrete and CSL abstract formulations, we see two um, distinct sets of constraints. We have one con set of constraints that's looking at making sure we have enough experienced technicians on staff to meet our monthly requirements. And then we have another set of constraints that are keeping track of how many experienced technicians we have on staff based on of how many quit and how many new trainees are now on board as full-time experienced um, technicians. So we're going to start off our constraints um, with this first one, which is making sure we keep track of or making sure that we meet the labor demands of each month. And in particular, we're going to focus more on this abstract formulation version of the constraint. Um, so there he is. So just like objective functions, there's a way to format constraints in PMO. And we essentially have a rule, which is going to be a Python function that when we give this function a specific subscript, it's going to be able to return a constraint for that subscript. It's essentially kind of like making a pattern to follow when making constraints. And once we have our function that knows how to make a constraint, we're going to use that function in a constraint function declaration. And this constraint function will use the provided rule and one or more sets to make all the necessary constraints. So step one is to create a function or a rule that's going to return a specific instance of this expression when we give it a value for t. And for the remainder of these slides, um, several videos ago, we replaced these hard-coded parameters with um, actual sort of soft parameters that we can change. So the 160, uh, that parameter we called hours exp, and the 50 we called hours trainee. So we're going to use those parameters in these constraints as well. Um, so here's our what that constraint function will look like in PMO, and let's take a closer look at that. So first off, it's a function, so it has to start with the keyword def, def. Every function also has to be given a name, and all the functions in our PMO model that we're using for rules, it's convenient to give them the sort of extension underscore rule. So we know that this is a rule that's either going to be used in our objective functions or one of our constraints. Next up, every single one of our rule functions has to be passed a model. Um, so here you can see we're passing this rule function a model, and that model gets used throughout um, this function many times. And then finally, after we've provided the rule a model, we can provide it as many parameters or arguments as it needs to make a single constraint. Um, so here, if we look up at our formulation constraint, we see that um, we're using the value t, that's sort of our unknown. Um, so since t is the only thing that we don't know, that's what we need to provide this constraint in order for it to make a specific instance of this constraint. Another way to figure out what we need to give to a constraint function is directly after the for all symbol, there'll be a list of one or more arguments over there. Here we see right after the for all symbol, we see um, a t. 
Um, so we know that we need to pass our hours rule of value for t in order for it to make a specific instance of this constraint. And then we see that t being used several times within this constraint. So later on in the background of our program, Piomo is going to be using this function and it won't pass a value t, it's going to pass an actual number. So it will pass, let's say, a 1 for month 1, and this t here will be a 1, this other t will be a 1, and the t for hours required will also be a 1. So it will create the specific instance of the constraint for month 1. And then after our list of function arguments, we end it with a colon. So the colon basically says execute all the lines after this colon as part of this function. And this function only does one thing. If you give it a value for t and a model, it's going to return you a constraint for that value of t. And if we look through this um, return statement, we see it matches very closely with our model formulation. So hours exp matches with model.hours exp. e sub t matches with our decision variable e. And again, instead of subscripts, we use square brackets. Hours trainee matches with our parameter model dot hours trainee. Our decision variable t sub t we call model dot t. And again, instead of subscripts, we use square brackets. Uh, we have a greater than or equal to sign. And then our hours required sub t parameter, we have a parameter in our model that we called model dot hours rec. And then again, since we can't use subscripts, um, we use square brackets instead of those subscripts. So the first part was creating a rule. The second part of creating a set of constraints is to use that constraint function. And this constraint function, we're going to pass it our rule. So it um, will make these constraints for us. So it's going to look something like this, where we have our rule. This is what we just wrote. And then we're going to look more closely at our constraint function declaration, which basically matches up our rule um, and a set so that a bunch of very specific instances of constraints can be written. So if we look more closely at that constraint definition down here, uh, we see that we're first adding a component to our model called hours needed per month. And then we see that we're using the constraint function in Piomo. Um, so it's basically telling our program that model.hours needed per month is going to be a set of constraints. If we're going to be making more than one constraint, like in this case, we're making one of those constraints for every single month, the very first argument we pass to the constraint function is a set. And the set that we are going to pass comes um, can be identified in the for all statement of our constraint. So in our formulation, we have that last part of the constraint that says for all t that are elements of months. That means we need to pass this constraint a set of months. Because we want to make one of these constraints for each one of those months. And then the last part of this constraint function is to provide the rule that it needs to use to make these constraints. So this rule name should match our function name that we just made, and we called it hours underscore rule. Now, in the next video, we're going to see how we can combine our model file with our data file to make a model instance. When that is done, in the background, Piomo is going to call the hours underscore rule function for every single one of the months in our model.month set. And it's going, to con it's going to create these five constraints that we see here on the screen. It'll create one constraint for month one, another constraint for month two, and so on until it's gone through all the months in the model.month set. Um, 
where it will have called the hours underscore rule five different times, once for each of those months. So if we take a second and compare our abstract model constraint code to our concrete model constraint code, we see that in our concrete model we needed five separate lines and we wrote each constraint um, on its own, which is fine when there's only five constraints to write, but if you imagine maybe we were planning for the next 37 years, that would be a heck of a lot of constraints to have to write by hand. Um, so instead in our abstract model, we provide basically a rule or a pattern to follow when making these constraints, and then Piomo can, makes all of the constraints for us. So we just finished up coding um, our meeting our monthly hourly requirements constraint. So now let's focus on the second set of constraints, which is basically relating the number of experienced technicians we have from month to month. And it's basically looking at um, from the month before, uh, we're only going to keep um, about 95% of those experienced technicians because 5% of them quit. And then we also will have from the month before all the technicians that we trained, they're ready to be experienced technicians in the current month. And we also see that we don't have all the same pattern for every single one of our months. Uh, if we are looking at month one, that's just a constant. That's how many experienced technicians we start with. And then it's only months two through five, um, which we see over here that follow um, sort of a more consistent pattern. Uh, so again, we're going to see that we've replaced our hard-coded parameters with our sort of abstract parameter placeholders here. And the very first part of making a constraint is defining the rule. And this rule is a little bit special. Oh. Well, I'll, and then the second part of creating a constraint is um, using the constraint function um, where we'll provide it a rule and one or more sets so that the constraint function can make all of the constraints that are required. So step one is we're going to write the Python function that returns one of these expressions when we give it a value for t. And in this particular rule, we're going to have an if statement. So we'll go over the logic here. And it's basically going to say, if the value for t that you've passed me is equal to 1, I want you to make the first constraint up there, which says e1 is equal to my starting experience parameter. And if this value of t you gave me is not 1, so if it's anything else, I want you to follow that pattern that's in the sort of second line of the constraint. So return me e sub t is equal to 1 minus the quit rate times e sub t minus 1 plus t sub t minus 1. And so we'll see this logic in our Python constraint. Um, so here's the Python code here. In the previous slides, it looked a little bit bigger. Here I've removed the comments so that it's a little more compact. Um, but like all Python functions, it starts with DEF or DEF. Um, every constraint function that we make should end with underscore rule to make it very clear that this is a rule we're going to be using in one of our constraints. As always, the very first argument or parameter we pass to our function is always a model. And we can see that model being used um, in six different places within this constraint, or within this constraint function. And then finally, after we provide the model, we can provide one or more other arguments that are required to make the constraint. So if we look up in our model formulation, we see that we just need a subscript for um, e and t. And in that subscript, we're calling t. Um, so since the only thing we don't really know is 
this subscript t, that's the only thing we need to provide to this function. Another way to figure out what you're providing to the constraint rule is to look at what follows the for all. So here we see for all t, so we know we need to pass this function a value for t. And then once we've finished off our list of function parameters or arguments, uh, we have a colon that says, all right, execute everything after this colon as long as it's indented. Uh, so this first if statement provides the logic that says, if the value of t is equal to 1, then make the month 1 constraint. Uh, something that's very important uh, in Python is that everything after the colon will be executed as long as it's indented. And the second you stop indenting, it won't run those lines as part of the if statement. And then we have the part of the logic that says, but if it's not a one, if it's anything else, then make the second option for my constraint. And here we see the elements of that second option. We see e sub t, we're using model dot e, and then in parentheses, or rather in square brackets, we see t, uh, because we don't have subscripts, so we use square brackets instead. 1 minus the quit rate, uh, we can see that down there as 1 minus model dot quit rate. That was the name of our parameter. E sub t minus 1, we see that we've called it model.e, and then in square brackets, t minus 1. And as long as the values for t are going to be numbers, you can do math with them. So our values in our set are the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we can do math with those values for t, because we know that they're going to be numbers. And then we see t sub t minus 1. Again, we see t minus 1 in square brackets um, because we can do math with those values of t because they are not going to be numbers. So for example, if we pass this function a value of t is equal to 3, this first t would be a 3. This subscript would be 3 minus 1, so it would turn to a 2. And this subscript would be 3 minus 1, so it would also be a 2. So we have our rule. The next thing we need to do is add our constraint function declaration, which will basically match our rule with a set so that Piomo in the background can make all the necessary constraints. So our code would look something like this, where we have our rule that we just made. And then we're going to look more closely at this constraint function declaration, which is going to um, basically match our rule with a set. and then. Pioma will take care of making all our constraints for us. Uh, so this first part of this rule says model.experienceTechConstraint. It's basically adding a component to our model called experienceTechConstraint. This constraint function that we're calling is uh, Pioma's constraint function. And it's basically saying, hey, model.experienceTechConstraint is going to be a set of constraints. If we're going to be making more than one constraint, which we are here, we're going to be making five, we want to, the very first argument in this constraint function is a set. And the set is going to hold all the values that we need to use to make our constraints. Um, so in this case, since we want a constraint for every month, we're going to pass it the model.months set. And finally, the rule argument is going to um, require one of our functions. So we just made the experience technician rule function. We're going to use that function here. So in the next video, you'll learn how to merge a model and a data file together to create an instance. When that process happens, uh, this uh, constraint function 
will call the experience technician rule function five times once for each month in the months in the model dot month set and the following five constraints are going to be made when it path when it calls this function with a value of one it's going to make basically the starting number of technicians constraint for month one and then when it calls that function for months two three four and five we'll get those more complicated constraints that are looking at um, for the experienced technicians in month two, for example, it's going to look at how many experienced technicians we have left from month one and also add in the number of people we trained in month one. And so we'll see five constraints in our model. And comparing our abstract model constraint code to our concrete model constraint code, when we made our concrete model, we needed to explicitly write out each one of our constraints um, in one line each. Um, but here, in our abstract model, we're making PMO do the work. So we've provided a function that tells PMO what to do, and it's going to call that function over and over and over again for however many months are in our model.month set. So if instead of looking at only five months, we wanted to look at 40 months, PMO will make us 40 constraints instead of just five. Uh, so, so far in our videos, we've created a model, we've defined sets and parameters, and included those um, elements in our data file. We've made decision variables, we've added an objective function. This video covered adding the constraints, and in the next video what you'll see is how to merge the model and data files together, and then finally how do you solve uh, the problem.